Um, we will now have a brief panel uh, discussion. I'd like to ask Shakira, Shahira to <laughs> Shahira and Len uh, on stage, please. If you have any questions for any of our two ladies, just please raise your hand and ask this morning. I'd like to request you to identify yourselves and then specify um, to whom your question is directed. Anyone? Questions from the audience or comments? No questions? The mic is working. Hello? Yes, in the back, please. Good, af Good afternoon. Uh, Dom Spagliawan from Leyte Normal University. Um, journalism is now uh, quite different from what it used to be. Uh, my question is, uh, how do present-day journalists, or how can present-day journalists uh, um, adjust themselves to, the, to these uh, changes no, in, in journalism? The question is, how do how journalists... Do they, how do they cope with these changes? Uh, knowing that they have been used to traditional journalism. Thank you. So how do you adjust to changes in journalism, especially those who have been used to traditional journalism? I'm from a different generation. I started out when there was no computer, no social media, I just had my pen and paper, my camera, and I would go and try and seek the information. Uh, I feel that your generation is extremely lucky because you have the information at your fingertips, but at the same time, it's a double-edged weapon. You have to be very careful, always verify your sources and, and make sure that, you know, check your facts. and. Um, I told you before that I follow the tweets, but then I know like five credible, well-respected bloggers and, and uh, those who use Twitter, uh, and I follow them, but again, I have to double check because one mistake would cost you your credibility. Uh, you know, you, you can very easily fall out of favor with your public. Um, journalists can't do anything but cope. <laughs> you have to cope. We have to cope. There's no choice. Um, if we want to be providing quality journalism to those people we serve, who are our audiences, who are the communities, who are the public, we need to learn new tricks, kumbaga. So, um, yeah, we have to research, try new ways of doing our work, we need to be creative, be collaborative to do our work. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes, please. The microphone will come to you. Hello. Hello. Um, uh, I am Joey Madea from Eastern Summer State University. Uh, Ms. Shahira, you're such an inspiring uh, journalist activist. Uh, but then, um, uh, I have a question. Um, since you are a journalist activist, and uh, obviously there is, a suppression, uh, there is a suppression in your country, as uh, I uh, always uh, watch it uh, in Al Jazeera. And uh, the question then, how do you, how much more in uh, the campus journalism? 
I, I believe there is also suppression in your country regarding campus journalism. So, do you have any initiatives to help campus uh, journalists uh, coop up uh, the government suppression? I think the, the question is, um, for campus journalists, there are restrictions. So, how, how can they cope with these restrictions? Although, of course, in Egypt, it's totally different. Actually, we do have the same restrictions in Egypt uh, on campus now. Students, before entering university, have to sign a form saying they will not engage in any kind of political activism. Uh, even though for years our universities were a hotbed for activism. Uh, and uh, your you mentioned Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera is banned in Egypt today. Um, uh, government officials accuse it of being pro-Muslim Brotherhood. But at the same time, Egyptian media also has one narrative now, which is the state or the official narrative. So journalists like myself who are not siding with either side, but who only want to report truth. It's an extremely difficult environment to work in. Uh, journalists are targeted, uh, they're shot, uh, they've been imprisoned. We have, uh, Egypt now is the third most dangerous country in the world for journalists, and uh, among the top 10 jailers of journalists in the world. So it's very difficult, but uh, you know, you do what you have to do, and you try and keep pushing the boundaries of the, the ceiling of freedom, and you find that, uh, you know, it's, it's a growing group of free voices in Egypt today, and we're coming together to support each other and, and try to get more journalists on board. This is what we're trying to do. Len, have you worked with campus journalists or done training with them? Um, actually, I started as a campus journalist, as many journalists siguro in the Philippines. Um, here, no, here we don't actually have restrictions in school um, for campus journalists, except uh, if you start writing about um, tuition fee increases, so there goes the, the challenge for us. So when it's already against the administration, then we face the problem. But there's a law that, that supports us and that protects us to free speech, so feel empowered. Okay, any other questions? Yes, gentleman at the back. Um, hello. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm John Michael Marine, and I just want to ask the question, um, how can you stand up to your belief and and also staying detached to the to the uh, to the to the uh, to the event to be, to stay uh, to stay your objectivity um how can you be objective if you would stand up to your belief and also how can you detach yourself from the news that you are writing to to stay on track on your objectivity I believe the question is, please correct me if my interpretation is correct. Um, how can you be objective while at the same time doing your story and uh, following what you believe in? Is that correct? More or less? And how can you allow yourself to be detached to your story? Because I think I jot it down cor correctly that you should stay detached. To your to the story. How do you, that you, I guess. How do you balance and detachment I did and objectivity? Give you examples of times when it was practically impossible, like during Tahrir, those 18 days in Tahrir, I chose not to report because I found that I was too involved. It was a personal story. So when it's personal and it hits home, it's very very difficult. But normally, that's what a journalist has to do: remain neutral and detached. So we try hard, but we are human. Anybody else? Yes. Ah, hold on. Let me call a woman. Yes. yes. 
Good afternoon. Um, it takes an enormous amount of courage to go against the many and question the authority. For a starting journalist who is working on my credentials and credibility, how do you think can I acquire the confidence to be different than others? How can I acquire the boldness to stand up and against the wrongdoings that I see? Uh, I would say it's, it, you're absolutely right. It's a lonely battle. And uh, sometimes, you know, you think when you find that you are against the flow, you know, the current becomes a bit strong at times when you feel that you, find, you face a lot of opposition for standing up. But because you believe in what you're doing uh, and you, you feel that there is light at the end of the tunnel, you will eventually make a difference. And even if you don't, you know that you're on the right side and that's what keeps you going. May I follow up? Is courage something that's, that you can learn or is it something that's inherent? I think we all can be courageous. Um, it's just that perhaps uh, I didn't live in Egypt for most of my life, so I was always encouraged to speak my mind. And I find that that's the difference between me and my colleagues who have lived under authoritarian regimes, who have been repressed for too long, and it's become the norm for them to accept to go with the flow. So I think this is something that you acquire from childhood uh, and that parents and teachers should, acquire, uh, should encourage uh, children from an early age to speak up. Len, do you want to add anything? Um, I'm just reflecting on the Filipino culture of being really obedient to seniors. Um, it's hard to, to talk when you have that culture. But courage can be learned. We need to really, um, if we would like to be heard, we need to develop ourselves to be courageous. And we could be courageous. It's, it should be innate in all of us. Yeah. I just add that Egyptian culture is not different from Filipino. It's very similar. And uh, a lot of people bow to authority, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, the government, is off limits, it's a red line for many Egyptians. And you know, they look at me and think, how can you be critical of the government? It's unpatriotic. No, it's not. You know, this is what a journalist does. You hold government to account as well as people. Actually, that's the great thing about journalism because you just break barriers. Um, there are laws, there are rules, but all in the, in the interest of truth-telling, I guess, you, you just break all the laws and the rules. Um, in the back, Bea. Hi. Hello. Hi. I'm Bea from Rappler. Hello. <laughs> um, this question is actually for Len. Uh, but first, I just want to say, nakakabilib yung nagawa nyo. Um, to all the local journalists here, may sobrang nakakabilib that you were able to do what you did despite what happened to you guys here in Tacloban and in other parts of Eastern Visayas. So, I think they deserve a round of applause. I'm sorry, but <laughs> nakakabilib talaga. Like, yeah. So, it's seldom, in the Philippines, I feel like it's seldom that local journalists, like the community journalists, get the spotlight, no? So, ngayon, um, how, what do you, how can the community help the local journalists do their job better? based on what you learned um, during Yolanda? I think we need to have this global network and help each other and reach out to each other and support each other, collaborate, exchange information and ideas. Uh, we have social media. Uh, we can always stay in touch on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, and, and, you know, it's very important for journalists to have this support system. If they don't have it at home locally from their own organizations, I didn't have it at home. I face a lot of hostility from my workmates who think that I'm the traitor whistleblower. But I've had a lot of enormous support from the international community, from you know, organizations like BBC and CNN that have kept me in the spotlight to keep me out of harm's way because they think that, you know, if they keep me uh, in the spotlight, I would be 
high profile and then the government would think twice before coming after me. So you need that support and we must continue to stay in touch. Len? Um, how can communities support journalists? When there's a problem in a community or in a city, in a society, journalists need to report about it, right? They can only report about it if they have sources. You are their sources. The communities are sources of journalists. So they can intensify the discussion of certain issues if we speak up. So in any, in whatever way that is, in social media, going to a radio station, going to a newspaper um, office, speak up and be a source, be the voice of your community and, and empower your community to participate in, in, in democracy by speaking up. Okay, I, uh, okay more hands now. Um, yes, the gentleman with glasses. Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'm Jason Tuang Tuang from Southern Leyte State University. Um, actually, my question is for Ms. Shahira Amin. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuhu. Um, as an activist journalist, how can you stand for truth when your life is at stake? It's all about choices, really. And if you're a journalist, it's a life mission. You have to be passionate about what you do and believe that you can make a difference. If you don't have this passion, quit now. Go and find a nine-to-five job because it's, it's a life mission. Um, yes. I'm from Eastern Summer State University. Um, this is not a question, this is a, some sort of seeking advice. So, comprising the youth, Mahatma Gandhi once said, be the change you wish the world to see. So, as the youth, what tips or techniques can you give us to us, since you are the expert on this for a day, so what tips can you give to us for us to be effective on our journey and for us to produce quality information for the audience. All the advice I gave you in my presentation to be, to seek truth, to be accurate, you know, never lose sight of your goal. And your goal is seeking truth and recounting it to the people. You have to be loyal to your public. That's my advice. And never, ever risk your credibility by faking evidence and, and falsifying truth. Um, we have this saying, uh, if you want to be a journalist if, and if you want to go to that path, how can you um, be committed to journalism? Your only advocacy is journalism, is quality, responsible journalism. So if you keep that in mind, you will never go wrong. Even if your news report or article would sound to be um, an activist uh, article or an advocacy to others, but maybe, or not maybe, but you're only surfacing the truth. So you may be judged, but stay to for journalism, for communities, and I'm sure you will never go astray. Can I give you an example of sure. something that happened in the newsroom? One of the chief editors gave me a, a bulletin to read and the headline was that Israel had attacked Hamas. I told her I didn't see it in the wires. That was, a long, that was in 2010. Uh, I told her the only thing I read was that Hamas had fired a rocket into southern Israel. She said, yes, but we can't say that. Can you? She wanted to fabricate news because she thought that she had to be on the side of Hamas and not Israel. So it's, it's stuff like that, that's a definite no-no. You never do that. Yes, the lady.
Hello po. Okay, good afternoon po. Uh, my name is Aliana Jean Sarmiento and I'm from the Visayas State University main campus. Uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, disaster preparedness. So uh, I hope that you would be able to give your advice or insights. So uh, we have this like uh, in, a, in the status quo. Uh, uh, no, four years ago, uh, Philippines has this uh, legal action, which is the law for relief and uh, relief and rehabil rehabilitation uh, operation for the Philippines. Now, uh, in 2010, it was uh, the DRRM Act or the Disaster Risk Reduction Management was uh, Act of 2010 was enacted. Okay, so it it's a um, it's mix of preparation and uh, preparation and mi mitigation during disaster uh, before disasters and then relief and rehabilitation uh, system now uh, with this kind of legal action from the government uh, what do you think is lacking with the philippine disaster system or what is there to improve uh, for the philippine disaster system knowing that we have this legal uh, action but we see that many filipinos are still uh, in danger uh, with natural and man-made disasters. So what do you think is there, uh, is there locking with our Philippine disaster system? Is there something that we have to like improve in your own insights as journalists and citizens? Thank you. Maybe Len would be in a better position to respond to that. It's a very challenging question. Um, how do I respond to that without frustrating you? Um, before the DRRM Act, there was the, how do, what do we call that? Um, National NDCC and National Disaster Coordinating, Coordinating Council. Council. So when 2010, uh, during the time of um, uh, Aquino, they changed it into the NDRRM. So all the NDCC, um, they, they were like, Parang they abol not really abolished, but it's like changed. So that's the challenge in our country. We change when the leadership change. Because instead of enhancing that, we create another entity to do something similar actually, or very similar. It's actually the same thing, what they want to do, but we change it because it's now called Disaster Risk Reduction. It's now DRR. So our name of the, of the council should also be DRR. I don't know if during the next uh, president, it will change again. So let us not let that happen. Para we can really, really prepare. Because if it changes again, then... Pag, pag may nagbabago kasi, if there is a change in the law, it has impact on the structure sa government. So, di ba, when NDRRMC was enacted, all the DREAMC, di ba, my NDREAMC national, P Dream C provincial. Meron pang ayat ang R Dream C regional. Tapos meron pang C Dream C city. M Dream C municipal. May B Dream C pa barangay. Mamaya may P Dream C porok, di ba? So <laughs> So lahat yan kini create and funds are allocated to those positions and to the administrative costs of those offices. So meaning Ma magastos. Uh, it's expensive. We need funds for it. So, I don't, um, maybe we need to, yes, demand that we don't change anymore. But we really need to focus on mechanisms that prepares us. But, so I hope na by next president, we, we retain this in Dream C and all the Dream C. Actually, tomorrow, um, there will be a whole discussion, a whole day's discussion on, um, on disaster, disaster preparedness, disaster response, and rehabilitation. So um, if you ask that question again tomorrow, there, you might get um, more answers and more perspective. Okay, ma'am, thank you. Uh, yes, gentleman to at the left. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Mar Moranti from Lady Colleges. Uh, I have these two, two realities, but both involves both involve journalists, student journalists, and then media practitioner journalists. 
Uh, one reality is this. It is a reality that, hey, for example, in Tacloban, local media, radio, some radio are affiliated with some politicians. That's one reality. Another reality is among students journalists. There are student journalists that are siding with the administration. There are student journalists that are somehow independent from the administration. The point is siding with, with some entity. Question is, would you please give us comment on where ethics now are in these two situations, realities? Um, as Maria Reza said earlier, you have to draw the line. When you choose to become a journalist, you have to decide that you are a journalist. You cannot be pro somebody. Maybe you can always be pro the people, but not a political person. Um, that's true. I will not deny it. Journalists in Tacloban and across the country, and I believe also in Metro Manila, have some linkage to political persons. It's not, it's, it's a fact. And it's a problem. It's our problem. And we actually as citizens have roles in that. How do we make journalists accountable to us? So in the, we, 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 we can't change anything if we don't speak up. So this forum right now is a good start. It's a good start for us to, to do something and to make democracy in the Philippines happen. Okay, I think we have time for maybe two more questions at the most. Um, the gentleman with glasses in the back, and then one lady. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Miles Colasito. I'm a government employee, but uh, full disclaimer, I am not representing my office today. In fact, I filed a leave of absence just to be with uh, this forum. I would like to second the motion of the gentleman there about corruption. And always the cause has been blamed on the poor economic uh, situation of journalists. That because, as you said, they are only paid around 75, and then there is no regular salary for many media personnel, not only here in Region 8, but throughout the country, they are forced to go with other personalities, uh, political, uh, political personalities or even business interests. And of course, their integrity is already compromised. So what do you think? is the solution to this rut, so that we will no longer be in this cycle. One solution is, again, uh, communities pay. Pay for the publication. If you demand quality information, have the money to support quality journalism. We cannot do this if we don't help each other. We can't demand this from journalists if they have no choice. So if we want to be sustainable, we need to participate in sustainability. So we need to, I don't know if it will happen. Like if we have a radio station, each single community contributes one peso, two pesos, to sustain that quality media. What will happen to a community if that happens? That the community owns the media. We protect it from being corrupted. We make sure that we are given a voice because we are part of it. But are you willing to contribute some money to run quality journalism? Are you willing to participate? Do you have the courage to be heard? So if you have that, we will forward democracy in the Philippines. Can 
I just add one small sentence? A good journalist cannot be bought. <laughs> That's all I want to say. Let me stress that Shahira said a good journalist cannot be bought. At any price. Um, the last... Okay, woman standing in the back. Thank you very much. I'm Mary Fia Florendo from a local TV station in Tacloban City. Cat Network. Um, to be honest, here in the locality, it's quite a challenge to be a media practitioner because here we don't earn that much. So you have to have that courage, that heart to pursue this career, which in, honestly, most of the media, media practitioner lost that heart and the courage to do or to pursue this career. So most of them take sides for a certain politi politician. So I just, I'm quite confused about being an activist because some of the media practitioners here, they who take sides for the politicians, some of them don't fabricate information. They, de they deliver facts. But the problem is they omit some facts just to be on this side or in this certain side. So I'm confused. Are they considered as an activist or just a partisan? I think it's very wrong if you know something and you hide it from the public because the public has a right to know. And if you want to be a journalist, there are sacrifices to be made. Uh, Sometimes I go for days without having a proper meal, without sleeping, away from my family. There is a price to be paid, and that's why I called it a life mission. Your heart has to be in it. If not, find another job. Okay, thank you very much, Shahira and Len. Let's give them... A round of applause.